Hi, I'm Tom Jacobs from tdjacobs.com and also healingsuicide.com. I'm an evolutionary astrologer and a channel and energy worker, a psychic medium. I do all kinds of different healing work, healing work, including a bunch of work on uh, Lilith, the true black moon Lilith, and also the asteroid Lilith. And uh, this video today is a profile, a bit of a karmic profile, but also a Lilith profile of um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, the American politician, uh, the youngest woman elected to the uh, U.S. House of Representatives, et cetera, uh, who's becoming a favorite of conservatives who are kind of obsessing over her here in the U.S. So I thought, I just looked at her chart and said, oh, <laughs> that's what's going on. I kind of wondered, what is it about her? Well, I'll get into it anyway. But what I want to tell you is for resources on Lilith, the, the True Black Moon Lilith Natal Report at tdjacobs.com will tell you about your own True Black Moon. Also the book Lilith Healing the Wild. And in April in Portland, Oregon, April 4th through 7th, I'm doing a six-person four-day healing intensive uh, called the Lilith Healing Intensive. And uh, so that is, is an option to, uh, to learn to clear energy. Well, I'm going to clear energy using your astrology chart, working with your spirit guides, send a master uh, to clear energy and help you live Lilith in a healthy way. And essentially within your own psyche and unconscious and your field and your body and your emotions, unearth the 6,000 years of patriarchal garbage with the imbalance and the dishonoring of the natural wild feminine within you. Whether you're a man or a woman in any given life, Lilith themes can become very important, but obviously it's more obvious when it comes to women and Lilith themes. So I'm going to talk about some of them and talk about in terms of uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, Cortez, Ocasio Cortez's chart. And, um, but anyway, check out the Lilith Healing Intensive April 4th through 7th in Portland, Oregon. On the Healing Courses uh, page on my site, you'll find uh, all the info. I've written out an explanation of what's going to happen and what to expect. And I also did a video uh, the other day, what to expect at the Lilith Intensive. So you can look that up too. So um, let me give you her birth data, and then I'll share her chart. Um, Ocasio-Cortez was born October 13th, 1989. Um, we don't know the birth time in Bronx, New York. So let me, um, let me share this. And I, yeah, let me share this little screen here. I haven't done this before, but what I did is I opened her chart in uh, this little program where I can uh, draw on it, it's the paint program on my computer, uh, so I can um, make little circles and whatnot. So anyway, so I'm gonna uh, do that and guide you through her chart as I see it. Typically when I do a karmic profile, I look at Pluto first, and that tells me what the empowerment journey the soul has set out for the human in many lifetimes, the ups and downs, the best and worst, and how to evolve from attaching power to externals like money, status, attractiveness, youth, respect from others, into the internal set, uh, process of working with the shadow, bringing light to shadow, um, learning about all your buttons, dealing with what you perceive are your inner monsters, and then becoming strong and confident regardless of externals. And it was kind of a magic, pro it's not magic, but it seems magical when I say it that way. But there's a process of becoming empowered through Pluto. So when I look at someone's Pluto, I always see the best and the worst for many lifetimes. So um, that's the first step. Second step of the story will be the south node of the moon. And uh, that tells me how that person has been conditioned to see the world in many lifetimes and uh, like a lens through which she's learned how to see the world because in the air in her family system is energy that fits the south node. She's imprinted in the root chakra when she's born. That imprint lasts the whole lifetime as the foundation for her whole life. Her emotional, psychological, spiritual foundation, she's always working with or against it, but it's very important. Third step of the story is the south node ruler by sign. And this tells me how she shows up as a unique individual in many lifetimes that may be different. So in this case, uh, Ocasio-Cortez is South Nose and Leo. The ruler is Sun, so Sun's in Libra. So we talk about those. Uh, Libra as her personal identity, right? Her, a deep layer of fundamental identity beyond the meaning of the Sun as the center of personality. It's a deeper layer as well as being the Sun and, and coincidental in her chart. Uh, then we talk about and its aspects, of course. Then we talk about the north node of the moon as what she hasn't been taught how to do in a bunch of lifetimes or hasn't been modeled in healthy ways for her. 
So she might, you know, we, she needs to grow into that way of being. So let's start with Pluto. Pluto's in Scorpio. And since we don't have a birth time, we don't have houses. And I recommend uh, when you do this, that just choose unknown time. It will default to 12 p.m. Um, so you're not confused by houses. Anyway, um, that I get confused by houses, so I don't do that. So anyway, so here we have uh, Pluto, right? Here it is in uh, just about the middle of Scorpio, 1408 Scorpio. So this is an empowerment journey about learning about power over power under dynamics. Now all Pluto is about power dynamics, but in Scorpio, you have to find out, or you're, you're, a person is challenged to find out um, what it takes to be strong and confident and who gets to be strong when, who gets to be right when. Do I have to fight in order to be confident? You know, but also Pluto and Scorpio people are driven by unconscious drives, motives, desires, attractions, repulsions. So Pluto and Scorpio says, I actually need to get to the bottom of my feelings and deal with those monsters and shadows and bring loving acceptance to the fact that I have, I possess all human motivations. I have access to all possible human feelings. Sometimes people put on Scorpio feel ashamed because they feel things so intensely or so deeply. Sometimes they're embarrassed about the truth of who they might turn out to be. And it gets very melodramatic. And if you're listening to this, you know, put on Scorpio, I'm not trying to pick on you. But if you could see yourself from the outside, and you sometimes have, you probably laugh at yourself a little for being so serious about what you think is wrong with you. So Pluto and Scorpio says, I need to plumb my empowerment journey rests in part upon plumbing the depths of my own psychology and my emotional landscape. And I need to uncover the sources of pain, fear, um, regret, jealousy, sorrow, anger, rage, blah, blah, all the fingers, whatever, all the different things. Uh, so people with Pluto and Scorpio have been majoring in many lifetimes in power dynamics, power over, power under. The greatest thing that people in that generation can do for themselves is to, um, and these are births from early 1984 to early 1985 or late 1983 to early 95. Um, Am I doing that right? Yeah, I'm doing that right. So, um, yeah, because Libra is up to like 83, 84. But um, the best thing that you can do for yourself if you have Pluto and, and Scorpio is to deal with your feelings without shame, without judging yourself. But that actually requ uh, entails learning how not to be afraid in the face of very intense emotions. So this is part, this is the, gener the astrological subgeneration or Pluto generation that she is part of. Now, we don't, I don't know a ton about her personal life, but I know that, you know, all the attention she's been getting is potential, right? She walks into power dynamics. And so this is a major theme for her to learn about in many, many lifetimes. Um, so I want to move on. I'm just going to kind of skate through some of this to get to the part what I really want to focus on. And by the way, if you're interested in your own Pluto generation, um, you have several options. You can get a reading, a soul's journey soundbite reading, which covers these four steps of your own karmic story in about 20 minutes. Uh, you can also, um, and if you want to learn how I do astrology, then you can become a member of the soul's journey soundbite database where I've anonymized and made searchable over 500 of those 20 minute readings. Right now the count is I think 535 and I have another 50 to enter sometime in the next few months. Um, but anyway, you can learn how I do these readings and also Evolutionary Astrology Basics 1, the home study course, to really get the story about soul and karma. It's not a basics astrology class, but evolutionary astrology. It's the entry point into this very high level way of understanding how you can see the journey of soul in any birth chart. So those are our options uh, in there. But anyway, um, I'll move, move on to the uh, second part of the story, and that is the south node of the moon. And, um, you know, what? Well, actually, one thing here with this Pluto is it is square the nodes, and so I will talk about that uh, here in, uh, in a minute. So let's talk about the south node for a minute. It is in Leo, of course, and uh, that says in many lifetimes, she's born into families where people are learning the right way to have ego, the right way to structure and um, figure out how to express the self and have creativity and shine, right? When you see her, she does often seem upbeat and full of that Leo archetype. 
And so you can see that, like you don't see Pluto and Scorpio, you know, in her. Of course, Pluto is not a, often a visible part of a person's, you know, persona or outward, outward life. But anyway, the south node often is. And so she'll see the world through, through the lens of Leo. Often people with this signature are born into families where there's a very strong egoic presence in the family that everyone else orbits, or it could be that everybody is having a strong creative streak or joyful streak, or that people are learning, you know, do, does my humor matter? Can I play a joke? Can I have fun? Like they're wondering how to have, you know, a healthy sense of ego while the creative streak, of course, is very uh, strong uh, within them. So um, there's that kind of shiny, bright thing that she seemed that she seems to bring, uh, and then of course we have um, Pluto is square the nodes, and I use ten degrees roughly, and this is just about that much, and so I'll use it, and so it means that unresolved uh, an unresolved issue in the multi life journey and in her family system is how to use power. All the stuff I said about Pluto and Scorpio, I didn't mention telling the truth. I talked about being honest with one's feelings, but that's a version of telling the truth here. Uh, but Pluto square the node says, I'm learning about what power is and isn't. I sometimes might grasp onto it, or I might never try to grasp onto it. I might overemphasize the importance of money or underemphasize the importance of money. Um, you know, like, like we've heard from her, um, uh, between the time she was elected, and when she took office, she there, there was like, you know, this petty coverage of her talking about um, getting a new apartment in D.C. and how expensive it is. And she's between jobs, essentially. So she was just talking about how that was a factor. She didn't make a huge deal about it, but other people did. I'll talk more about that and why people want to make a big deal about her uh, for various reasons. And some of them are obvious and some of them aren't as we get into the Lilith story in a, in a couple of minutes. But Pluto and Scorpio square the nodes says, I'm learning about what power is and isn't. When I say what squares to the nodes is, like I say, an unresolved issue. I don't teach it's a skip step or a misstep. People always assume that because other people teach that. And I teach that it's an unresolved issue. You know four or five out of the eight or 10 things that will be good to know. So you will rely on those four or five things habit and preference and you might trip over your shoelaces or put your foot stick your foot in your mouth or shoot yourself on the foot lots of foot imagery um foot metaphors but you know you might trip over something over and over and over again until you learn how to break the assumptions that lead to those behaviors in other words change the beliefs which is changing karma changing deep beliefs attached to emotion is changing karma so when she encounters power over power under dynamics, how she responds is very important because um, she is in need of learning healthy ways to deal with these apparent disparities in power dynamics. Okay, now let's, um, let's move on. Let me see, are there other squares? No, there are not. So let's uh, move on to the South Node ruler by sign. This is, um, this is step three of the story and it tells me how this person shows up as a unique individual. So the South Node says, me and my family, we are working through these kinds of themes together. South Node ruler is special skills and talents that I show up with. And so in her case, South Node is, of course, in Leo. Its ruler is Sun. We go to Libra. So I am listening to people. I may be focused on relationship. I may be interested in justice, equality, balance, harmony. I may bring a strong creative streak. Um, I may be charming. I may have a lot of experience being a professional listener or salesperson where I can get through to people because I can put myself in their shoes and they feel it. So that's a strength of a Libra South Node ruler. Of course, on the personality level, Sun is in Libra. So her whole you know, conscious self and personality is organized around some of these ideas about Libra. Um, but we have some conjunctions here uh, that are really important and then, then another aspect. One of, um, actually two other aspects beyond the conjunctions. So we have Juno and Juno says that you're committed or you might tend to commit to things, to justice, harmony, balance, other people. It's easy uh, because of um, some people's work with asteroid goddesses, it's really easy to assume it's about marriage. So she should be married or would be married. It's not about marriage. 
uh, Juno is the only goddess who is married, but think about the commitment that creates marriage. Till death do us part, I do. Think about that as a more useful guideline for even if, you know, I have Juno conjunct my son. I'm not married. I will likely never get married, but I have Juno with my son. So it's central to my identity, but I will commit to certain things. It is in my nature to be committed, even if there's not actual like formal, you know, marriage. So think about it in terms of commitment. She will be committed to causes or to her own creativity and expression. She'll be committed to these things. And, um, that can lead to a deep sense of confidence because you have conviction. You know what matters to you and you've made a commitment. The other, another here is Mars, the, the symbol of like one of the warrior symbols in the chart, the other being Pallas Athene. Mars is the instinctive scrappy fighter. Uh, it's about defense. It's about desire. It's about saying yes and no. It's about fire and instinct and impulsiveness. Uh, so that's wrapped up in her journey, too. She's a fighter. It's in Libra, so she's probably polite at times. You know, she has the ability to be charming and polite and to make people like her if she wants. But she also has that fighting spirit. And so this is, you know, and I think we see that with her comments. Like, it's, I think it's good, you know, the way she talks about certain things and what she's committed to and what stands she'll take regarding certain political issues. Uh, she's a warrior. She's got the fighting spirit. The other conjunction is to, in this chart, it shows up as uh, L-I-L and O in parentheses. That means the osculating apogee or the true black moon Lilith. It's not oscillating. It's osculating. O-S-C-U-L-A-T-I-N-G. Uh, and that is a technical term for how it moves. Uh, it's a point and it's a function of the moon's orbit around the earth. So the way I work with Lilith, and I'm told my approach is the only positive one out there uh, that really doesn't demonize Lilith. I don't start with the idea that Lilith is a demon. I start with the idea that we, through our patriarchal philosophy, have demonized the natural feminine and demonized Lilith. Again, the, the Blackman Lilith Middle Report, Lilith Healing the Wild, the book, that's available on Kindle, Amazon, and tdjacobs.com, and also the four-day Lilithelia Intensive if you're committed and really want to get into these issues and heal this stuff. But we've demonized the feminine culturally and therefore in every way. So um, my approach to Lilith is instinctive root chakra wisdom. The, the wisdom of the cycles of the earth and nature as they are preloaded into our root chakra, meaning like when you get a computer – and an operating system is already installed, Lilith is already installed when you're born in your consciousness within your root chakra. So an instinctive need to say yes and no, to honor biochemistry, to honor hormones and pheromones, to honor, you know, the food choices and how you treat your body and how you approach sexuality and who you're open to, who you, who you are friends with, like to let instinct and guide you in ways that sometimes you can't explain. That's Lilith. I talk about it as the, it looks good on paper syndrome, where everybody says, you have to meet my friend, Bill. Bill is great. Here are five things that you will love about Bill. And he will love things about you. You say, well, sure, let's all meet Bill. And you meet Bill and immediately your skin crawls and you can't stand to be there. And there's no reason. He's nice. He's polite. He's not snarling or throwing things. Uh, you know, he's not like blowing things up or like whatever. He's not waving knives around. He's not uh, yelling and screaming. But you in your body, your biochemistry, your energy field and how those link together are saying no, not Bill. That is Lilith as well. So, People with strong Lilith, and this is where we get back to uh, Ocasio-Cortez, people with strong Lilith energy operate instinctively. So first of all, she's got the sun conjunct Mars. That's a level of instinct. Another layer of instinct is the true Blackman Lilith conjunct the sun and south node ruler sun. So she's going to show up as a Lilith figure in a bunch of lifetimes. Now, some people with this signature well, and the reason I'm the reason I'm doing uh, this, the reason I'm inspired to do this right now, is because some people who are Lilith people 
when they have stuff thrown at them, uh, insults, accusations, gossip, manipulations, projections, whatever, and she's got all these things. When some little people receive that stuff, they take it in and it's hurtful. It's very harmful. And of course, that's what the Lilith Intensive is, is meant to clear. If you've been vilified for being Lilith, for listening to your instinct, for being autonomous, for having boundaries with a relationship, for saying no to sex at times, like are you vilified for being Lilith? For her, she shows up as Lilith and she's obviously unapologetic. Now she's 29. It could be that in younger years she was less confident, but you know, I, I don't know anything about her, young, her younger life really. But um, she has a strong Lilith energy, and at least as she shows up right now, she doesn't take on these things. So the reason that I wanted to do this video and explain this to you is because she's getting so much attention, and she will continue to do so, especially after um, uh, conservatives have, have, since Nancy Pelosi got the, the House speakership, they've stopped focusing on her because – they can't do anything now to shame, to uh, tarnish her reputation to prevent that. So anyway, now they focus on this young upstart who doesn't know anything or whatever is inexperienced and, and whatever. Uh, and they focus on all of these things about her appearance, about her clothing, about everything, but focusing on these things. And what triggered this video is I was reading an article where a former staffer for Hillary Clinton's uh, 2016 campaign said and it was quoted in some article, if you, basically, if you objectify a woman, uh, if you make of her a sex object, and you say, and you make it seem like you would have sex with her, or you wouldn't, like that value judgment in there, first you objectify her, put her in that space, in your mind, in your words, and then you decide, thumbs up or thumbs down, you're asserting, you're making a power move. We all, we all know that this happens. We know this is true. But the, but the article went on to say, but this doesn't affect Ocasio-Cortez. She seems not to be affected. Now, I would argue that people have hearts and people are sensitive. So she may be on some level affected, but she has a depth of confidence regarding this Lilith Mars sun thing. To And like I said, with Pluto and Scorpio, she's been through the ringer of all different kinds of uh, important and stupid power dynamics in many lifetimes, but, um, but she doesn't let it affect her. Like one example that, that got caught in my imagination was this, uh, this video of her dancing as part of this like student ambassador program when she was at Boston University and um, kind of recreating a scene, a rooftop dancing scene from the breakfast club and, and how some conservative dug it up and put it out and basically said, oh, it's a video of her dancing in high school, whatever. And all these people were responding with, oh, how terrible. She enjoys things or she has fun or she has friends. She's fun. And, um, and then her response to that included a little bit of lip sync and dancing out and then dancing into her, uh, like for 10 seconds, into her office in the congressional office building. Like she didn't accept shame from people trying to shame her. The same thing with the comments about how much her clothes cost or whatever it is, you know. So anyway, Lilith people have the option <laughs> of absorbing those projections or having a deep sense of inner knowledge and inner self-like, self-love to not accept those things. So healthy Lilith overcomes the projections and the attempts to punish from others, the attempts to control and shame. Healthy Lilith knows who she is. Whoever you are, man or woman, whatever, any age, healthy Lilith knows exactly who she is and isn't afraid of the pettiness from other people. So we all need to get there. And all of my work on Lilith is focused on helping individuals. I mean, the teaching is reaching a lot of people, so it's, it's spreading, so it's reaching collectives. But it's focused on each individual learning to validate the self and stop expecting to be shamed or punished. Stop, in other words, being willing to be shamed. So she's a great example of not being willing to be made wrong because she exists, a strong Lilith figure. Um, she does seem young and that's going to continue. I mean, she is young relative to all the, you know, a lot of the people in, in uh, U.S. politics uh, in, in the Congress where she's now a member. Um, but she, you know, is feminine. She's attractive. She's not 
deepening her voice and trying to, you know, she's not trying to put on any airs. She's speaking honestly. So we're going to see a lot more uh, coverage and frankly obsession over her until they, until the conservatives need another poster child for picking on the Democrats or whatever. Um, maybe, you know, they pick on her too because they say her ideas are half baked and they talk about the, the threat of socialism because she identifies as a democratic socialist or socialistic Democrat, democratic socialist. Anyway, they're going to do that too. And that's fine. But she has such a, a confidence where she's not willing to let other people overpower her in that way. So that's a very healthy Lilith example for all of us, uh, by the way. Now, let me talk about the other aspects here with Lilith or with this the South Node ruler and Lilith. Um, I'll just say, actually, let's say South Node ruler is square Chiron, but Lilith is not. So she brings the Lilith and the Juno and the Mars energy. So that's central to her multi-life identity. And, um, and then the, the South Node ruler itself, so she in many lifetimes, will feel squared by Chiron and Cancer. This can be the emotional wounding of other people. This can be wounds at home or people in the family who are sick or debilitated or something like that. Um, and it can be also an extreme sensitivity to others' needs. And there are two kinds of ways to respond to this. One is to learn about and be open to learning about humanity and the reality that people experience through being squared by Chiron, because Chiron is other people suffering in pain, or you can be closed to it. And so this is one of the reasons, this is the primary reason why she is a democratic socialist instead of just being a Democrat, because she's extremely aware of the actual facts on the ground of how things affect people in real life. So this is, this is one of the reasons why, because some people with, with Southland Ruler Square Chiron shut down because it's messy to deal with other people's pain and suffering. And you aren't sure how, comp some people aren't sure how compassionate they can afford to be because it can be draining to deal with other people's suffering. So anyway, so this is one of the reasons why she is, um, why she is this, uh, why she fits into that category, why she identifies as a democratic socialist. It's caring about people. Now, just as a side note, for Bernie Sanders, who is also kind of in that groove, uh, through um, he has a south node in Pisces, and so he's very aware of the world and the collective. So for him, and I don't remember the rest of his chart, but but he has that orientation toward we are all one, we're in this together. And and Ocasio Cortez, it shows up a little differently, but this is also this is also true. Um, I do want to talk about the south node ruler being opposite Eris. Uh, Eris is a dwarf planet, and over here, let's, um, ba, ba, ba. oh yeah, there we go, square Chiron, okay, undo that, sorry, I forgot why I was doing this, and then uh, usually I would do this as an audio thing, so I wouldn't even have uh, uh, this little program up, anyway, so we can look at Eris over here, my imperfect uh, circle, my oval, and Eris is about uh, strife and discord, and when you do something, if others get triggered into blaming you for how they feel as a result, this is the example I always use. Oh, and I'll tell you that um, in Living Myth 2, Explore, um, Sacred Psychology, there's a long chapter on Eris to explain this whole archetype. But what happens is, let's say that you and I are friends and I'm coming to get you and we're going to go do something together. On the way to your house, all I can think is, oh, this thing with my mom, it's so painful. I don't, I'm not quite sure how to heal it. And we're, we're having a conflict and it just, every time I think about it, it stings. I don't know what to do about it. It's my own thing and it's kind of buried and I don't know how to deal with it. When I get to your house, you get in the car and you don't know this is happening. You don't know that I've been thinking about this and that it hurts, but seemingly randomly or coincidentally, you are, you can't stop talking about how supportive and awesome and great your mom is. Everything you say stings. This is Eris. My vulnerability, my insecurity, my pain, my raw nerve being brought to the surface and exposed, then what do I do? Do I make you wrong? Do I blame you? Do I try to make you hurt? So to distract from, you know, this is what bullies do. This is what Trump does. Do I try, you know, like, um, what about this crime you've committed? Oh, yeah, well, what about the crimes Obama committed? It's like trying to, like, lash out and try to deflect. That's an heiress uh, kind of thing. And so she, in many lifetimes, carrying the confidence of Mars, 
the commitment of Juno, the warrior spirit of Mars, the commitment of Juno, the clarity of what she's committed to, and this self knowledge and self trust and autonomous spirit of Lilith, where she's willing to be who she is without apology, she's opposed by heiress people. So their insecurities being revealed. And that's a lot of what's going on with her entrance into the House of Representatives and all these. Uh, old white guys realizing, essentially old white guys, realizing that the world has changed. The world is continuing to change. A, she's brown. She's young. She's a woman who isn't afraid to speak up. And they don't affect her. They're going to keep freaking out about her because they don't know how to manage her. Again, Lilith. So that triggers their insecurities. Now, Eris works both ways in a person. Um, one has insecurities, but one, and they'll be triggered by others, but then also other people get triggered by us. So when you're confident, others may feel, may feel their lack of confidence revealed in whatever part of life you have your heiress. So, um, so that's a theme for her in many, many lifetimes. Uh, it can make somebody not want to listen to others, but she seems to be in a good groove with it. She seems to recognize I don't know if she would say I'm compassionate toward it, but she seems to recognize that it's a game, that it's a way that people are struggling to figure out how to deal with her. Personally. So Lilith and Eris, these are the two myths in the chart I deal with, of the, myth, the myths of the difficult women, difficult woman or difficult women. So they get vilified. Eris is the one who doesn't get to invited to the party because she is about strife and discord. People failing to understand that catalyzation into growth is important. Like the, the discord and strife makes one aware, uh, the triggering, pushing buttons makes one aware of one's insecurities, right? Like the old white dudes in the Republican Party here in the US, like realizing, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, the world is changing. Yeah, you're dinosaurs. Your time is coming up. Anyway, so that, that kind of triggering actually causes growth because if they want to stay relevant, they'll pay attention to why she is so interesting to voters. She unseated an incumbent who was the fourth most uh, time-wise, ranking-wise in the House, the fourth most uh, senior Republican who basically had been in there for years I don't know, over 10 years, maybe 15 or something. You can look that up. I can't remember. But she, she unseated him. And so then they're like, wait a minute. Could we be unseated by some brown child? So anyway, she, her, you know, how she deals with that, I don't have a clear sense of, but she seems not brought into the petty schoolyard games. She seems to have clever, funny, pithy, smart-ass responses to these criticisms when she takes the time to respond. But anyway, that is opposing South Node ruler. So in some lifetimes, she may feel she can't get through to people because of their insecurities. That's the kind of meaning of Eris opposing the South Node ruler. So now uh, let me finish this out by talking about uh, the North Node. And this is about uh, learning to individuate and march to the beat of one's own drummer. Uh, I don't know enough about her yet to really speak to how this may look in her life or if she's doing it or not. But typically the North Node is what we haven't been taught is normal in many lifetimes. And so we leave it out. So anyway, objective... Uh, working with others towards shared goals, you know, being involved in groups and politics fits with, with Aquarius ideas. If you find the right tribe and if you work with others, and sometimes it's about community organizing, which she seems to have a flavor of. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's the North Node, which she hasn't been taught in a bunch of lifetimes as Aquarius. Um, but anyway, so I'm not going to focus on that. I do want to mention one other thing here, at least one other thing. Um, well, actually, uh, by extension here, uh, Chiron and Jupiter are obviously conjunct, and Jupiter is conjunct series. So by extension, this is another way of looking at, on the personality level, the democratic socialist idea, actually caring about what happens to people. Ceres is the protector, nurturing, mother, parent influence uh, who provides to people. Ceres is the most important deity to the masses of people in ancient Rome. She's the harvest grain goddess. So Ceres conjunct Jupiter, the way she has faith 
in life and expands is through series, nurturing, caring about people. And that's Kanjan Chiron, aware of the wounds, aware of suffering and pain. Obviously, she hasn't turned away from the reality of human suffering. She's a democratic socialist, interested in certain social issues. So I just want to mention that for a moment. And then uh, I want to talk about this uh, stellium up here in Capricorn. We can leave out the galactic center there. Um, but this whole bit, this is not involved in the karmic story, but I want to um, just mention it briefly. Um, because she's part of this little subset of people born in the late 80s, uh, people born in 88, 89, who have um, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Saturn conjunct. And she actually has Vesta thrown in there. I just want to mention this because it may seem confusing at times when you're thinking about this because, wait a minute, isn't Saturn the opposite of Uranus and vice versa? How does that work? In this case, you have uh, two parts of the psyche, or actually four parts, but I'll break it down. Four parts of the psyche working through this lens of Capricorn. So they are like sitting next to each other, sharing notes, working together. It's a coalition inside your head since we're talking about uh, this Congresswoman. Um, sometimes it's like a click, like they feel special and they don't talk to others, but, but sometimes it's just these parts of you are working in the same groove together. We don't have a birth time, so it, it's possible that they're in different houses since this covers 11 degrees, one Capricorn through 12. Uh, it's possible, but um, parts of her psyche working in Capricorn together. Uranus is individuation, genius, the need to create freedom. It's uh, marching to the beat of one's own drummer. It's setting oneself apart. It's being so authentic, you become eccentric and eclectic. You don't fit in with the status quo, right? But then Saturn is the need to become mature, and it is about the status quo. It's about developing consistency and maturity and becoming realistic and having your life become something of value that you can offer to others. So there's this like Saturn maturation thing conjunct Neptune, which is about finding a higher truth or connecting to the masses. People with strong Neptune energy um, sometimes can't keep track of phone numbers and their keys and don't remember what time it is. Uh, but some of them also feel connected to a higher purpose, which she definitely does. And then Vesta is a sense of devotion or what I like to say with Vesta is it can add a sense of religiosity to what it touches. Like people who are really religious, you know, sometimes, well, I guess that's the wrong word to say, religiosity, because I was going to say that people won't do it halfway, but the idea is that instead of religiosity, I'll say a sense of importance is imbued to whatever Vesta touches. So here, Saturn, it's in, with an orb directly of Saturn and Neptune. So work, Saturn, on behalf of, a, or to serve a higher principle, Neptune, or a higher truth, or the world, the earth, the collective, or something, the masses, and Vesta, devotion to it. Uh, actually, now that I see that, I, I realize I have a Saturn and Vesta together in my own chart. Dif different sign, and, and it's my ninth house, so they're both retrograde. But what it does is it lends an incredible amount of focus to ninth house Gemini work. So focus is what Saturn and Vesta each have in common. And so there's this um, you know, ability to push through things and really focus. But sometimes with Vesta, or when it's healthy and active, one doesn't do something halfway. So like I tell people, if when I teach about Vesta, uh, for me, I don't take astrology like, like it's not a joke for me. Like spiritual teaching and these divination principles and these teachings, it's very important to me. So if I meet somebody at, who, like through another person, like a friend of a friend, and that person says, oh, you're an astrologer, guess my sign. Part of me will be crestfallen. I will just, ah, uh, because this is not a joke. It's not a parlor game. And, and, you know, and I don't do this, but part of me has this chip on the shoulder because it's, it's so important to me. I just don't want it to be treated like a joke. So it's all or nothing. But some part of me wants to say something like, tell me the month and year you're born. And I'll tell you something that really matters about you. But like, screw your sun sign. I don't care. It's not a parlor trick. I don't ever do that. But, but there's a sense of importance. And for her, work, Saturn, and being an authentic adult, uh, Uranus, is tied with a sense of what's true, Neptune, and a devotion, a sense of service, Vesta. 
So that is the other thing. Um, okay, so that is uh, the end of this uh, profile of her. If you want your own four-step profile, uh, get the Soul's Journey soundbite for yourself. And they make great gifts as well. I used to advertise them as giving the gift of insight because think about the themes of your whole entire life spelled out in about 20 minutes, including I'm discerning in the chart beliefs and karma that may have developed and how to change them, that the beliefs may have you stuck. People think karma can't be changed, but when you understand that there are beliefs attached to deep emotions that are hard to deal with, you can change it. And also check out the Lilith book, the Lilith report, and the Lilith four-day healing intensive in from April 4th through 7th, 2019 in Portland, Oregon. It's only open to six people. So uh, if you're interested in that, read on the healing courses page of tdjacobs.com. Be in touch over email, Tom at TD Jacobs, with any questions about the Lilith Healing Intensive or anything else. And uh, I look forward to working with you at some point. And um, take care of yourself. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your time and energy.